Put a Haggadah for a second. For a second, I'll discuss this question because it's interesting. We're we're talking about the uh, why? Why would be a problem? We're talking about generally autonomous cars, but the real problem, the current problem for a lot of observant people. Yeah, no, I wanted to, yeah, I want to talk about that. It's interesting, uh, and that is uh, one second. The, the the practical issue at hand right now, which is becoming a more of a problem for the observant community, is voice-activated uh, devices on Shabbat. Already people are questioning, you know, the, uh, the why would it be forbidden to use a cell phone, for example, which now it's all touch screen. You really don't activate anything. It has to do with, uh, you know, electromagnetic uh, 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 fields and touch, and not it's not... Uh, uh, electric activation, all that, and we know that uh, Rabbi uh, David Lush and Rabbi Nachum Elazar Rabinovich both ruled that you could use electromagnetic cards. I mean, the for hotel, fully right? Orthodox people like on on Shabbat to enter a hotel or something like that. Uh, so you have to break like voice activation into two two segments from the point of view Allah. One is what is electricity, and we discussed several times electricity, even on Shabbat, would be only a rabbinical prohibition. Because the, you, uh, the current is always there. You are just causing stream of action that will lead to a certain thing. Um, even though many many rabbis, mainly Ashkenazi rabbis, but all the Sephardi rabbis, try to argue that using electricity on Shabbat is a biblical prohibition. It's like uh, lighting fire. It's not true. Uh, electricity is not fire. It could cause fire, but it's not fire. That's one thing. But the other thing is the idea of using a voice-activated uh, device on Shabbat. It's basically like using a microphone. It's a, when, no, okay, not a microphone. This is like using a combination of using a microphone and telling a non-Jew to do work for your Shabbat, right? Because you're using your voice. When you tell someone, right, right do this for me, you're you using your voice. Command, yeah. Right. <clears throat> so we know that you could, you could tell a non-Jew to do work for your Shabbat when it, when it involves... Uh, something that is needed for Shabbat and when the prohibition is not biblical. I mean, if you have the combination of those two, you could do that. Why is that? Because biblically, from the, like what we call the, the, the law of the Torah, you could tell the non-Jew to do anything for you on Shabbat. You could tell him, you know, cook for me, drive for me, do anything. The, the reason the Torah did not make it forbidden is that at the time of the Torah, the, the uh, idea of employment her fee was not that common. You had you had slaves who, were, who worked for you. In the time of the rabbis, when it was less common, people didn't own slaves, and they uh, outsourced everything to employees. Then the rabbis feared that you will outsource everything to non-Jews who will work for you. So they limited it. They said you cannot ask a non-Jew to do work for your Shabbat. But they knew it will be necessary at a certain point. So they made a, an exception. Let's <coughs> say mitzvah. It's all hikadol if it's a, for it's a mitzvah, for the synagogue, for onik Shabbat, or, or to protect yourself on Shabbat, etc. And if uh, you tell the non-Jew indirectly, and if it's not a biblical prohibition. So for example, in Europe, in uh, medieval times, very, uh, you know, uh, in many cases, people in very cold uh, uh, environments would tell the goy to, tell the non-Jew, to light the fire for them in the uh, in the fireplace on Shabbat, because Shabbat. it's Goy Shabbat every Shabbat on a regular basis. Goy Shabbat. Yeah, yeah, Goy Shabbat. Non, a non Jewish person, right? So that we know. Let's say, for example, now uh, the uh, you would tell the non Jew to check the news for you on Shabbat, right? The question would be: Do is it necessary? Is it something that makes you feel comfortable on Shabbat or not? So that question was already discussed in the in the Shohan Aruch. Originally, they said that you cannot uh, uh, on Shabbat, you only talk about issues of Shabbat, of Torah, and all that. And you cannot discuss the news. But then, that also happened in, in medieval times. The Rema says that. Uh, if you enjoy, it says, That was back, back then, the news was, which king killed the other king and who went to battle, right? So if you enjoy that, you could, you could do it on Shabbat. So one could argue, I could ask, uh, you know, a non to check the news from your Shabbat. I'm giving this very uh, trivial example, right? So the other thing is about voice activation, and this is like using a microphone. 
So uh, it seems like across the border, all Orthodox rabbis are against using microphone on Shabbat, right? Like the, today, the, the, the dividing line between Orthodox synagogue and non-Orthodox synagogues, mm-hmm. one of the main things is the microphone on Shabbat. But it's not that simple. Rabbi Yosef Bishash of Meknes ruled already in the 50s that there's no problem in using a microphone on Shabbat. Meaning if it's turned on or if someone, uh, if it's by a timer or the non-Jew turns it on on Shabbat, actually using it on Shabbat involves no prohibition because there's no direct action, no physical action, and the, and the sound waves does not, do not, uh, uh, create, do not, are not considered a, uh, a transgression of Shabbat. The, the reason they made it forbidden is more because of perception, because how would it look like, what would people say? Now, if you ask, you know, from a practical point of view, would it help, would it enhance the experience of Shabbat? In some cases, yes. Sometimes you would like everybody to be quiet and to lead the services without using a microphone. But on Yom Kippur, when you have a full synagogue, 400, 500 people, people talk, people cannot hear in the back. Or when uh, I deliver the speech, people in the back cannot hear. Maybe it would have been useful if I could, uh, if I could do to that. Drop. I'd like to jump in and say something. And you know what? It's, there's so much sense in what you're saying because I know personally for me, my wife... When she used to come here for the high holidays, she would sit obviously in the back, and at the end of the service, she says, you know what? I don't feel involved. I don't right. hear anything. I can't right. be... I'm not, I don't feel like I'm part of it. Right, right. You know? So this is exactly the problem. Exactly the problem. Thing, my wife doesn't want to come because she doesn't yes. hear you. She doesn't okay. hear anything. So we're, we're, we're going to bring this to the board. Let's say, are we going with Rabbi Mishash or with the... Uh, so, but, but the interesting thing is that... And, and that, that is surprising. I mean, I need your input on this. <laughs> what do you say? So the interesting thing, thank you. The interesting thing about a microphone on Shabbat I had is discussion that discussion with big rabbi about the matzot. I yeah. told them about twenty. It takes twenty six hours. Yeah, just they won't believe you on that. And even if they no, try, it, yeah, it. yeah. Just, you have to try and see. Tamu. Anyway. Regarding the microphone on Shabbat, all Orthodox Jews use microphones on Shabbat. They just don't use them in the Beth Knesset because if uh, someone who's, who's wearing a hearing device is using a microphone, mm-hmm. maybe today is a little yeah. different because no, it, it's, it's based microphone. on it's vibrations, but it's basically 100%. the same concept. Yeah. You are causing an action through sound waves, and it you know and and, the, and it is amplified for the uh, hearing impaired person, right? So someone, I told this argument to someone, he says, no, it's because of pikuah nefesh. Uh, what do what we pikuah nefesh? <coughs> the, the, the deaf person must protect himself from dangers. So he has to wear the device, so if he hears cars coming, this is really, I mean, it's the borders on the ridiculous. Right. But besides that, if you, say, if you tell me that a deaf person can only hear, have the hearing device to save himself from danger, right, then I am not allowed to talk to him. Right, he should go around with the sign. <laughs> uh, don't don't talk to me. Right, don't talk to me because I have hearing device. So obviously, this is not about halacha. It's about perception. It's the same reason why many Orthodox rabbis were against having a bat mitzvah, because as the reform movement started, so we are not going to do that. My grandfather had, uh, you know, established in our family. My oldest sister, who's now almost sixty, did her bat mitzvah. So almost 50 years ago. In Israel was not... Right, in Israel was not very common. Like, an Orthodox family is celebrating Bar Mitzvah and all that. Uh, another example, you know, of a larger, larger scope is the Hebrew language. The Orthodox community, the ultra Orthodox community, originally was completely against using the Hebrew language because they, they, they associated its revival with the, uh, the anti-religious movement, with the Lezer Ben Yehuda. But the Sephardim always spoke Hebrew. There's not a problem for them. Anyway, but this is a, uh, as I said, it's about a perception. So technically, using a microphone on Shabbat is not a problem. Uh, asking an angel to do work for you, I'm saying all technically. Don't, don't rush to, uh, to connect it next Shabbat. Not yet. Uh, technically, asking an angel to ask, do something for you when it's not a biblical prohibition <coughs> and when it's for the purpose of enjoying on Shabbat is allowed. And uh, voice activation is also not a problem. So now what is the real problem? Like what you said before, it's where you draw the line. 
Mm-hmm. Why are the rabbis so concerned? Because they say Shabbat is sacred. If we tell people, if we tell our children that they could use voice-activated device on Shabbat, so they'll spend, you know, okay, so they're not going to use the phone. The phone is there, it's a Siri, right? Go to Netflix, open, you know, uh, recently watched episodes and can try continue, whatever. <coughs> or, you know, stock market, whatever, you can do anything you want with it, right? But the, the question is, is it forbidden or not? What, what, what is your concern? So I'll give you an extreme example. Extreme example to, to the, to the uh, idea of how far you can control certain things. And again, when I give you this example, it doesn't mean that I'm in favor of one side or another. Um, actually, I am in favor of one side, I'll tell you. That is about uh, you know, the problem of drugs. In America and the whole world, right? There's a war on drugs. Did the authorities make any progress in the war on drugs? No. They don't want Nothing. To. They don't want to. No, they want to. <laughs> Believe me, they want to. They, be, they want to. Of course they want to. People, no, they don't want to. People are killed. Crime is rising. Wait, 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 wait. Let me. I'll give you. I'll give you one. One second. I'll give you. I'll give you the. People are dying. Crime is rising. You spend billions of dollars fighting, you know, the drug lords. In, I lived in Colombia. I can tell you that. Right? How how dangerous it is. You didn't bring any. I didn't bring any. No. I <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, Mexico, you know what's happening in Mexico. The, 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 the land is ruled by them, right? And now, in America, there was a whole process of uh, legalizing marijuana, right? Pot. There, there were voices, in, in the past it was William Breton, was the chief of uh, NYPD police. Very, very tough uh, law enforcement uh, uh, agent. And I, I heard recently an interview with the, with the person who was the head of the equivalent of the FBI in Australia for many, many decades, Mick Palmer. And his argument, <coughs> both argue for the, same, for the same concept. He says we have to decriminalize drugs. Com- all drugs. Like in Holland. De- yeah, all drugs. Now, this sound, sounds crazy, right? But he says, what happens if you decriminalize drugs? The value goes down. The value is down. There's no incentive. Like if you're a farmer in Colombia, and people say, okay, you could either grow, uh, you know, uh, poppy seeds, right, uh, for, for, to produce uh, drugs, or regular, uh, any, any regular crops. He will go for that. There's no incentive. There are no billions of dollars there. Uh, most people who use drugs do not use them is this, the addiction is not automatic. It, it is co- a combination of many other factors, of environment, of depression, and all that. And people who want to get them, get them anyway with the uh, opioids and, and painkillers and all that. It says if you, if you uh, switch the problem from a criminal problem to an ethical health, a mental problem, it would be easier to deal with it without all this uh, you know, violence involved. Just think back, you know, it sounds crazy. But if you know the history of the uh, of the prohibition in America, right? There was a prohibition against selling uh, liquor. Liquor. I mean, here in Maryland, still, you don't know there's a liquor store. It's hidden behind. Right? Uh, no, I didn't know. That's controlled by the county. Controlled. No, but it's like you know, it's a it's a it's a remnant of that time. What? But what was created as a result of the prohibition? Organized crime. Organized crime and the mafia. <laughs> this this is a, you give an incentive. Okay, so why? What is the analogy? The analogy is this. We are talking about the character of Shabbat. The, 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 how, do you, how do you celebrate your Shabbat? What, what, uh, what is the, uh, the atmosphere? What is the, the image of Shabbat? How do you do it with your family? Now, there's a limit to how the rabbis can control that and to control what is going within your house, within your family. It's about how you educate your children. It's about how, what you bring to the table, right? When they try, if, if the rabbis would, would have been more honest, right? Like Rabbi Meshach, for example. Like what I'm trying to do, Rabbi Shlush, and other, uh, other rabbis. And would say, listen, this is, according to Halakha, this is allowed. This is what you could do. Whether you want to use it or not, it's your choice. The fact that something is allowed doesn't mean that automatically I'm going to use it. Yes, so yeah, there will be people who say, I'm going to use this technology, to get to the synagogue. Other people would say, I'm going to use this technology to go to work. But you know what? I know people who did that without this technology. And I know people who were observant 
And then at a certain <coughs> point, became non, let's say non-observant, and they use for them they use transportation on Shabbat to go to work, they go to work, they work regularly. But after a month or two, they say, you know what? It doesn't feel right. I don't want to work on Shabbat. I want to rest. So they scaled back. But and then when it goes through this process of you making the decision, what is the character of Shabbat for you? It becomes something that you own, and it, 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 it is not controlled by an outside uh, body. The way it happens today, each time the rabbis make such a decision of saying this is forbidden, and if you do this, you're not an Orthodox person. They're pushing people out, and they're constricting more their Orthodox communities. So, uh, if, you know, you have to live within the Ewov, you have to live within the walking distance. You have... Uh, just recently, I was in a, in a, on a uh, conversion uh, case of a, of a yeah, very uh, brilliant woman who works with the State Department. She, she was positioned different places in the world, and her next, uh, her next place to work is outside uh, Rome, like she's going to be in Italy, right? So the rabbis who were with me and who were leading the conversion told her, uh, you know, uh, usually they only would allow a conversion where a person lives within a walking distance to a synagogue, right? I told them, but I know in, in, in Italy there are good, there's a good train system, right? You're, you could take the train and ride to, uh, I don't know if she's outside Rome or Venice, and join a uh, minyan on Shabbat, right? The other rabbis wanted to kill me for saying that. I said, this is a psaq written by Rab Meshash. It's published in Otsar HaMikhtavim, in Maim Hayim. And many other people agree on that, right? What are the options here? Here she's a, a, she was going to be the only Jew in the city, right, for a year or two, and she will not have an, op- an option to celebrate Shabbat, or she uses this hetel, right? Probably when she'll come back here, she wouldn't need to use it. So this is where you draw the line. The answer is that you don't draw a line. There, there's a very large area, which is the twilight zone, which is uh, between what is... forbidden and 100% permitted is a very wide zone in between where there's room for uh, personal decisions. And you make it, and and it's also different, uh, there's a difference between making decisions on a personal level, like this is what I do at home with the family. Let's say someone decides that voice activation or microphone is okay, but they'll do it at home, but not yet in the synagogue because here it's a public matter. It's the (coughs) <coughs> image of the synagogue as an orthodox synagogue, etc., etc. So this is, uh, this is uh, I think, the axis around which this whole discussion uh, is revolving. But another element of that is, I think, that the young generation, the millennials, you know, people are called, they are called today uh, native digitals, <coughs> because they were born into the digital uh, revolution. They don't remember, you know, us people, when we try to say sometimes, uh, you know, call me, it, you know, you used to like do the movement of a, rotary. of a rotary dial, right? Then we became more advanced, and we do this like finger to the hand. This even even this, a finger to the mouth and to the ear is outdated, yeah. right? That's not a phone anymore. That's a flip phone, <laughs> right? But so they there are certain things that you talk to them. So what? Well, I don't know that this existed, and they look at things completely differently, and they will be the people who will shape the halakha. For the from now to the who knows twenty first to the twenty fifth century. We'll stop here.